So my name is Joshua McAbrake. I am a structural engineer, chartered structural engineer with a background in building design. Uh, I'm completing an engineering doctorate uh, under Professor Tiziana Rosetto into building damage predictions um, for disaster risk um, assessment and modelling. Um, alongside those guides, uh, guises, I've worked on a number of overseas development and post-disaster response and reconnaissance projects over the years. Um, and today I'm going to be talking about um, the work of uh, this organisation, the um, Urban Search and Rescue NGO SARAID, Search and Rescue Assistance in Disasters, for whom I volunteer as one of the engineers on the team, uh, alongside Mark Scorer uh, from Atkins, who I've brought some of your slides here, I hope you don't mind, um, and, uh, and Ruth Haynes, who runs her own consultancy. Um, what I'm going to talk about today is what USAR, what USAR is, where the engineers fit in, and then um, just give you a very uh, brief uh, snapshot of what that was like in Nepal. Um, so what is Urban Search and Rescue, or USAR? Well, it's, it's finding and extracting people in trapped buildings, um, often uh, overseas earthquakes. Um, that involves finding the casualty uh, using dogs, using technical search equipment like snake cams, sound equipment, etc. Um, then accessing the casualty by breaching through walls, floors, roofs, um, using disc cutters, um, hammer drills, sledgehammers, etc. Um, it might involve uh, moving heavy objects such as slabs that could be pinning um, or trapping uh, the uh, uh, or in the way um, of getting to the uh, to the victim. It might involve shoring, which is building temporary timber structures to prevent or prolong further collapse of the building that might occur due to, for example, an aftershock, which could trap, injure, or kill team members inside the building and the original casualties. Um, and then um, applying necessary first aid to the casualty to stabilize them, to get them out of the building and hand them on to, to further care. And a lot of that um, involves working at heights or moving uh, horizontally, vertically, through holes, uh, across gaps, etc. Um, what does that look like uh, on a work site? So we might be tasked with a particular building to search, or we might come across it on a wider area search, and the general process would be to do a quick recce of the site, which might involve um, speaking to, uh, ideally it would involve speaking to the, to the locals, asking simple questions like how many people might be trapped, um, where might they be in the building, when was the last time you heard from them, um, is there a basement, is there electricity, and so on and so forth. Um, then we would be eliminating the, the, um, the utilities, the, the water and electricity, then doing a primary surface search, um, perhaps using um, the dogs if they're available, um, and then later using the technical search equipment, um, and then we'll be um, exploring voids and accessing the, the structure from there. So that's what it, that's what it should look like. Um, why do you need an engineer there? Well, the engineer's role is to devise the safest way to access and egress the structure. Um, is a collapsed building ever safe? Then, of course not. We wouldn't be there if, 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 we, if it was. Um, so our job is really to identify and assess the risk and then to devise the best way to um, avoid, remove, mitigate or mon and then monitor that, that risk. Uh, the photos on the on the left here are from um, Haiti, where uh, this is from a school in Haiti, where the team was tasked with finding if any of the children, the many children that were trapped in that building, um, were still alive. In the middle here, you have a hotel from Haiti. Um, uh, I wasn't there, but I believe this is uh, perhaps a four-story structure where the ground floor and the second floor have uh, have pancaked. So you're looking at the uh, I think you're looking at the second and the fourth there um, with a collapsed roof structure. And just, just take a second to have a look at that and, and think if you, where are in that building, where are trapped live casualties likely to be? So if you're standing in front of that building, um, where will you be prioritizing your searches? So the answer isn't here and here because an international search and rescue team um, as an international search and rescue team, you're very unlikely to be standing in front of that building in any less than 72, maybe 48 hours. So in that time, anybody trapped in any intact parts of the building will most likely have been able to self-extract their neighbours um, or the emergency services, if they're there, to be able to get them out. What you're there for is to find the entombed people that couldn't self-extract, that couldn't be taken out by 
um, by the first responders, which means that if anybody is still alive in that building, they would be, they would be in the collapsed parts here and down here. Um, and that should hopefully give you an image of what it is that we're, we're being required to do. Um, just give you a very quick uh, snapshot, an overview of, of, um, of my experiences in Nepal from a first person perspective. Um, during our deployment, the SAR raid deployment, to the magnitude 7.8 earthquake that occurred on a Saturday afternoon or lunchtime in April two years ago, um, with an epicenter that was uh, around 80 kilometers to the northwest of Kathmandu. Um, Nepal put out, the Nepali government put out a general call for assistance, which activates the UN's um, international response mechanism with various components and international actors. Um, we are unable to access Kathmandu directly because the airport was damaged and, and closed, which meant that we had to go to Delhi. On arriving in Delhi, the airport in Kathmandu had opened, and we were able to take an onwards, uh, onward flight from there. Um, the, there's a there's a structure in place, as I say, um, but there's a lot of difficulties in, um, in the early hours, which is what I'm trying to, to get across. And uh, one important thing is that the UN doesn't um, own a disaster. Um, the disaster is owned by the local emergency management authority and the, the, the host country. Um, and so in our case, we arrived um, in the middle of the night. We were allocated a place for our base of operations by the, um, by the military. Um, and then the following morning, the military um, briefed the team leaders. Now, the, so the early hours are really characterized by a, a chronic lack of information, So, especially where connectivity is impaired. So there's no telecoms. Satcoms are, uh, are very intermittent because of the surrounding mountains, which means that on the way there, all we really have is sensationalist media images of collapsed buildings, people trapped, etc. But when we arrive, um, we're given a number of taskings by the military, and what we see is that rather than a flattened city, which was the case in, in, in Haiti and other disasters, you're seeing a functioning city in Kathmandu, functioning city um, with pockets of, uh, of local destruction. And we were actually tasked by the military to go to fairly remote locations, um, which actually took several hours to drive to. Um, one example being a fairly remote village. Um, we were tasked with a hotel. The hotel turned out to be a hiker's shack, several hours hike up the, up the mountain, and there was no confirmation of anyone missing there. It was just that the phone lines were down. So perhaps that wasn't the most, you know. There at the village, we are asked by locals who see us to come and search different buildings, uh, such as this one. And in the area um, is a lot of non-engineered, unreinforced masonry, which which disintegrates upon collapse, forming a solid mound of rubble. And as an international search and rescue team arriving several days later, in order to find an entombed person, uh, a live person, you require that person to be relatively uninjured, such that loss of blood wouldn't have caused them to, to, to pass away. But crucially, you would require them to be able to breathe. Now, these types of um, structures that disintegrate um, People are able to lift the bricks, etc., by hand, so they don't necessarily need the more heavy-duty kit that international teams would be bringing. But also, because there is a, there's a lack of voids within that rubble mound, then people who can't be extracted by hand quickly by their neighbours probably will have suffocated before, um, uh, before international assistance is able to get there. So the short of it is, on the first day, uh, no one found alive. Um, Returning back to the base of operations on that evening, uh, we see that that kind of fairly haphazard taskings um, was common with the other USAR teams as well. And so SAR aides and the US teams, the Dutch teams, and a number of other teams committed people to the, uh, the UCC, the USAR coordination cell, to work through the night to devise a plan um, that can be presented to Lima um, as a suggestion of the best way to, to allocate taskings. Um, the, the way that that was done was by collating all of the information, all of the um, collapsed buildings or areas of heavy damage, um, knowledge of people trapped, etc., 
collating all of the resources, the USAR teams in country, numbers of people, numbers of dogs, numbers of medics, etc. Um, and crucially, sectorizing the city along physical barriers so that teams, so that the resources can be allocated to each sector and you can carry out a more um, systematic search. Um, this, was, this was presented to Lima in the morning, to the military in the morning. They said they agreed to that, which meant that the second day had some more meaningful taskings. And um, as we're going conducting our searches, you can see lots of examples of very poor um, quality construction. Um, you also see uh, uncoordinated demolition. So we're arriving at rubble piles to look for potentially live victims. And at the same time, you have cars being dumped on top of those, uh, those rubble piles. Um, and this is a view from inside one of the, the, one of the buildings. And um, this is just an example of what you're there to spot as an engineer. And you can see um, large cracks through the, through the lintel of a heavily deformed door. And um, obviously, without looking at the rest of the structure, what might be happening here is that this wall wants to deform in plane. And that wall, is, that, that door is actually there acting, uh, potentially acting structurally, which is, which is a case of um, exactly what happened in, uh, in, in Haiti on another building. So your role as an engineer is to say, OK, don't breach there. Let's find another way. Um, so at the end of the second day, uh, nobody found. Um, just to give you one example here, and this will be the last example. Um, this is one of the buildings that we found on the, that we went to on the third day. It was a six-story reinforced concrete building. And one of the tasks as an engineer, again, is to figure out what's happened to the building, how did it collapse, how might it further collapse, and, and how could you prevent that? So just want to take a second and have a look at this building um, and say and have a think about where the building was originally standing and which way it's it's fallen down. Um, so I'm going to ask for a show of hands. Um, was the building originally standing on the left or right? Um, show of hands for uh, originally on the left. Show of hands for originally on the right. Very non-committal. Okay, cool. <laughs> um, yeah, speaking to the locals confirmed that the building actually started here on the left. And what's happened there is that the ground floor columns have failed. The building has overturned. The floors have sheared away. And then what you're left with here is actually a view of the ceiling, the underside of each of those, each of those slabs. Now, this area down here was a playground. And it was thought there were people there at the time. And so they were asking us if we, we, can, we can search the building. And obviously, your initial reaction is, well, it's unlikely to be anyone alive, but again, you're there. You're there to find the difficult people. The easy ones would have been found already. So, primary surface search. Um, the dogs run over the structure. Um, one of the dogs indicates, um, or the dogs. The dogs are trained to only indicate live scent. They don't uh, indicate uh, dead people. Um, don't ask me how. That magic is pretty good, um, and they're, they're very good at it. And um, one of them was behaving oddly. In the words of the dog handler, it was behaving oddly in a particular location. So members of our team um, then accessed the, the structure in that location. And when they were there, they thought they may have heard uh, faint tapping. So they accessed a little bit further into the structure using hand tools. They just breached a little bit further, opened up another void. Um, and the dogs were sent in again. And both dogs, uh, neither dog, indicated uh, live scent. So I'll stop the examples there um, and just give a, just a quick snapshot of the uh, overview on the 4th of May, uh, so it's before the second aftershock, um, or the, the main aftershock happened a few days later. Um, and, and the key figures to pull out here is that you had 8,500 people killed at this point in time. Um, in country, you had nearly 2,000 rescue workers and, and uh, medical personnel. And the other, the other number here that's quite important is this one. You had around 16 people saved uh, by the international effort, and this is where they were. Um, and the question there is, is really why? Why? Um, when you have Haiti, when you have other disasters, more people were saved, many more people were saved. So really, what was the difference here and, and, and what happened? And that's really the, that's really the purpose of post-disaster um, post assessments, um, learning the important lessons about why these, why these things didn't, uh, went the way they did. But then, and then also disseminating those lessons to the people that are actually going to make a difference. So capacity building, or this is a case of what Sare does of actually training first responders. Um, because when you have international teams who are arriving three days, four days later, um, it's really the first responders, your neighbours, your colleagues, the emergency services that are pulling people out of the, the rubble. So it's capacity building there that saves the most lives. So um, I think I'll, I'll, I'll stop there. Um, there's lots of things to discuss, but hopefully we can bring that out in the discussion. Um, 
But the point is that USAR is there to save lives and to demonstrate to people on the ground that the international community is there and we're there to do whatever we can to help. Um, engineers are a very central part of that, and, and if you're interested in being involved, then, then get in touch. Thanks. Thank you.